Did she have Facebook or something? Mm -hmm. We're now live streaming on Facebook and YouTube from the Grace Exhibition Space on Avenue C and 10th Street in Manhattan, New York. And this is the Tuning Fork, our pre-show with Tamara Lane. Uh, welcome, Tamara. And Hi. Tamara is uh, one of the co-founders of uh, System Changers. Um, that's your sort of new incarnation, right, Tamara? That's right. And uh, Greetings to everybody on Facebook and YouTube and in the Zoom environment. Um, so tomorrow, perhaps we could talk a little bit about um, our work together and what uh, System Changers is, and then we can uh, invite people to watch the show uh, afterwards on social media, et cetera. Um, and after our talk, we'll begin our show with Alan. And there's Ron Smith coming in. Okay, so tomorrow, tell us what what's going on, and and, and congratulations on your Emmy. Thank what an amazing you. show about um, recognition software and uh, the ethics of that. Mm -hmm. you want to tell us a little bit about that, and um, and then you know, just like to celebrate a little bit your your Emmy. Ah, uh, thank you. Very excited about it, especially because. It's a story I'm really proud of. Um, I got to cover and um, do the story of activist investors who are fighting to put a code of ethics into facial recognition and AI, and AI software. Um, and what's really special is this, uh, the activist investors are a group of nuns, a coalition of nuns that have come together um, and really fight for their values. And I think that it's a story that not a lot of people know about um, and not a lot of people know about the nuns role in really helping implement better business values into large corporations. So, you know, if, if you have time, dig deeper into that. But um, that was something that was really unique and fun and uh, a good story to cover. Now, is that interesting in terms of your identity uh, as a social changer producer and actor, having had that recognition? Yeah, a hundred percent. I spent over a decade in the news covering stories always working really hard <clears throat> to fight for the good story, right? The story that um, that would uncover injustice or, you know, help someone um, on a personal level, keep people in their homes, fight con um, environmental contamination, things like that, trying to get those stories. And, you know, then sometimes you were covering stories of lost cats in Brooklyn. Um, and that was just kind of the nature of doing news. And so what I found really thrilling about this and especially this story and, and um, some of the stories I was able to do was that it was, it was a really great story and inspiration and something that shows that, you know, uh, if you put your values first and fight for them, you can really have a good outcome. Well, what's going on with system changers? What is system changers? And and um, maybe we can give people a link to watch your show um, during our program today. We'll we'll send a, send a link up there. Awesome. Um, yeah. People are joining find... us right away from uh, di different spaces and different platforms. So uh, occasionally we welcome everybody. And um, well, it's very exciting tomorrow to have you a part of our. 30th show. It's a it's an anniversary for us, a sort of a, you know benchmark. And um, I'm very excited that you've invited me to be part of the System Changers and to bring the Institute for Cultural Activism onto the platform uh, with our meditation um, modules as well. And this week we have uh, a meditation, one of the first live meditations on the System Changers platforms. So what is System Changer? And, and um, you know, turn us on to how this could be an important instrument and method for communicating with this community and between the silos that I know you're gonna talk about, these silos. So for example, the Institute for Cultural Activism might be considered part of a cultural a silo of some, some, some kind. Why don't you tell us a little bit about all that? Yeah, a hundred percent. So one, we are so excited to have you on the platform because we think your insight that you're going to share and what you're going to bring to it is just so valuable, especially in initiating change in this world. So systems changer, and obviously you get the 
uh, our company name, our organization's name is about um, helping foster systems change and positive change in the world. Um, and the way we're doing that is through a global curated community think tank. And so that means that we are bringing people together from all over the world um, to cultivate, foster, initiate, catalyze change. And we do that through insight and collaboration. And so on our community think tank, um, we are bringing together insight from experts. So peer to peer insight, like John yourself, bringing insight of you know, initiating that mindset to be able to do cultural change and be able to, to activate change to experts in ESG, as well as um, people and organizations working on sustainable development goals. And what we're doing is we're bringing everybody together on a platform, we're sharing ideas, we're working on concepts and outcomes. So white papers, articles, reports, frameworks, and we're being able to put it out into the world. And through um, our editorial team, we're really able, able to foster high-end content that has the most impact. So not only when you're on the site, will you be learning maybe things that you need to know for um, ESG, which is environmental social governments um, implementation, as well as ways that you can harness uh, data, technology, innovation to really reach your goals for SDG um, outcomes. So if you've got an organization and you're working on um, one of the sustainable development goals, um, you, you're be in the right place being a part of our community. So just for a moment, talk, talk about the topics, the issues that are presently, well, for example, what happened last year at the Global Summit? You had a summit of some kind, some kind of sem symposium. What That's was that right. symposium? Yeah, this, this really spun out of a, a symposium that we held last year. And it was on systems change and really looking at the frameworks that are needed for systems change from every level um, of the spectrum. So we had entrepreneurs who were talking about what they were doing. Um, people from the C-suite, we had government representatives really talking about what the issues they were facing today and what they needed in order to create um, a sustainable change for positive impact. And what we found was, you know, every organization kind of works in their own silos, like you mentioned before. And what we need is we need to bring everybody together in order to really create that sustainable change, right? And I could use the example like, um, you know, bringing telemedicine to an area that doesn't have um, internet is not going to work, right? Or, or the ability to um, create that infrastructure. So you need to have the government representatives talking to the innovators, talking to um, the technologists, and you got to you have to bring it into one place to create these solutions. So that's what we're doing is we're bringing it into one place and we're, um, you know, facilitating that helping make those connections helping create the outcomes. There's a community that's growing on system changers. Um, and so what we experience being on the system changers platform is a sort of space where there is change taking place. From a kind of trickle, trickle up and integrating of all these different silos and, and disciplines um, in um, the social uh, space, including industry, ecology, um, economics, right, yeah. finance finance so the, looking at all the old models yep. all the old paradigms and together within this community of creative thinkers and changers developing a kind of um, model or program with different models for how society can uh, be changed how the world can be a more beneficial a healthy place that's inclusive etc a hundred percent. And what you can expect when you get on the platform is you can expect two things. One, you can expect an area to get um, the latest insight that you need for uh, ESG or SDG outcomes, right? So if you need to um, look at what's happening in frameworks and policy, it, what other businesses are doing to incorporate these positive outcomes, um, roadblocks that people have overcome, leadership mindset for this, you'll be able to find um, exclusive insight that we're creating through our editorial team and our award-winning editorial team, which we're really proud of. So that's kind of your quick hit. You've got all the information you need 
in this space. Um, so you can kind of cut through the noise. Then you can go into our working groups and you can find areas where you can collaborate with other leaders in, um, in areas that you want to help in. So like I said, we're creating white papers, we're creating frameworks, we're creating policies that we're putting out there. You can join in, you can be a part of this and you can have your voice heard and you can get it out there to create positive change. Give us and a kind of scenario. What? I should mention too, then we have a, a space specifically for um, reflect and relax. And, and in that space, you'll find um, specific to people who are going out leaders and to people who are going out in the world trying to initiate change. You'll find meditations like what John is going to be doing for us, as well as other tools that you can utilize to get yourself in the right mindset to go out there and really activate change. Because we think that's important. So tomorrow, I've come up with a title for the live show on Thursday. Okay. Mind change. Yes. Okay. So we can talk about that in the back room later on. And, and you know what? That's I, so important, especially when we talk about this. We have to have our own mind in the right place, and we have to also be able to change some other people's minds. So I love it. So tomorrow, give us a concrete example of what might be able to occur at the World Economic Summit in Davos, Switzerland in January in relationship to system changers. How, how can system changers in some way trickle up or impact uh, what's happening in Davos? I'm really glad you mentioned that. Um, and that's actually something that our, I tell them our editorial team is working on now, which is um, something that as a, a member of the community you get um, from us, which is we're going to be providing um, in, information packets for these um, bigger events that are happening around the world you know, every year, like the World Economic Forum, like the UN General Assembly, as well as things like Art, um, Art Basel and South by Southwest for what people working in ESG and SDG can do and can think um, and can make happen. So for example, with the World Economic Forum, we're putting together a brief for people of who we're watching, why we're watching them, um, what events we've, we think uh, are significant for people working in this area, as well as um, what we expect to happen there, what we want to happen and how we can move forward in order to initiate the change we want to see. Because in these events, you know, so often we just kind of watch them happen. We want to be able to create a brief and create some action items that people can use if they're going or if they're, you know, watching and want to try and, you know, through whatever means possible, start, you know, prodding businesses or policymakers to create their change. Okay. So uh, we're inviting everybody in this Zoom meeting and on Facebook and YouTube Live to join the meditation session on Thursday, the 16th of December at 4 p.m. And how long will that session be? We don't have a link yet. But, um, but. I can put the link in, if you give me a second, I'll put the link in the chat for everybody or for, for you, you to then share. Um, well, that's, uh, well, that, John, I was gonna leave up to you because I definitely can't wait for this and I, <laughs> I am not leaving right. the meditation. Well, just to fill an idea, we are, we are it, it's fresh, it's new, and we're developing it along, along with your input. So thanks everyone for being part of that um, meditation experience with us called Mind Change on this coming Thursday at 4 p.m. on the System Changes platform. And, we're gonna uh, send out the link. We're going to put a chat in the chat box. We'll have a link for that in a few moments. Um, so, tomorrow, thanks a million for um, christening the 30th uh, program, Tuning Fork. And um, we're welcoming Alan now to, uh, to join the conversation and, and to uh, help us navigate his, his world and his space, which is uh, a very empathetic space of, of uh, transforming our minds through, through art. Um, so, anyway. Thanks Thank a million, Tamara. And you. I hope you I hope you come stick around for part of the show at least, and maybe join at the end of the show in case anybody has has some comments or questions for you. Absolutely, uh, if you'd like to do that. Absolutely. No pressure if you're busy because you're a system changer.
<laughs> Thank you. We know what you're doing in the back room. Uh, we feel it. Okay. Well, thanks a million. All right. So um, now we go to the more. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm going to share, Alan, some um, little background music before we begin Great. speaking with each other. Great. And, and thanks uh, for inviting me to be part of Tuning Fork. I really appreciate that. Ah, well, uh, there's tomorrow's link, by the way, everyone, in the chat for the uh, mind change meditation practice on Thursday. Alan, it's an interesting uh, experience because Emily and I created the Tuning Fork during the most severe time of the lockdown here in New York, a time when we felt that there was a strong need for community, um, a community that wanted to be sort of in, in touch with each other and a community that uh, is proactive in the sense of uh, the cultural space of cultural activism. So it's been um, a remote um, live session, um, perhaps in the space behind us over the next few weeks, we'll make it into a live show where people can come into the space and be kind of like an old style live TV show you know, with applause and everything, you know, and booing, mm -hmm. uh, we, we hope. Hopefully so, not. <laughs> yeah, right. So we, maybe one day you'll be here in the audience throwing tomatoes at us or at yourself. So anyway, um, so Emily might need to help me do a share with high quality sound. Let's see how to do that. Advanced sharing options, yes. Only host. I don't know. Go to share. Just go to share. Now it's, share sound, optimize for video. Oh, optimize sound. Okay. All right. So, oh my goodness, I have to go somewhere here. Oh, man. I have to go to my desktop. So this is, this is why all right, hold on now. Can you see Alan there? No. 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 You have to um, share again. Thanks for your patience, folks. Let me just dial this up. With Beatles. Okay, let's try that. Uh -huh. Let's try that. I think there's, there is hope. There is hope right there. There we go. So Alan, can you hear me there? Yes, I can. So I've just, um, put these materials together today. Um, don't be sad, be there. That's nice. Um, and if you notice the, in the background music, uh, it's actually, let's see if I can change this now. Like let it be. Uh huh. And um, when you play it forwards, it's playing the Beatles' "Let It Be" backwards. You remember in the old days there was uh, there was the uh, one of the Beatles tracks that was said that that if you played it backwards, it would. Um, say that John is dead. Remember yes, that? I remember that. But mm -hmm. I, I played it backwards so that I wouldn't get bumped off the internet for using it to promote your work and our show tonight. Oh, oh because of licensing requirements. Is that why? It worked. It worked, <laughs> Alan. It worked. 
Now, I just want to say on, on a personal level, <laughs> on a personal level, that um, just speaking for myself, of course, but it's just meeting you and seeing your work uh, uh, has been, I think, one of the most exquisite things in my life. And it, it, it seems that somehow we're, we're of the same mind, if you don't, if you don't mind mm -hmm. me saying so. Um, it, it's as though, you know, some part of my consciousness is merged with some other consciousness in this world where what you're making is very close to me. And um, it's just kind of um, astonishing, uh, your work, Ellen. And I thank, thank, you. thank you for Thanks. the enormous output and the persistent um, sort of uh, rascally, um, constantly inquiring aspect of, of the work. Um, so in a few moments, we'll do some more screen sharing. Um, but I just wanted to say, you know, how exciting it is to actually have met you. And I had I have to tell the audience that when I was about uh, 19 years old, so that was sometime in the late 1970s, I think. No, yeah, 74. Um, my aunt actually gave me, if I'm not mistaken, a document of a work that you did and this was like my first sort of direct contact with, with um, you know, a very dynamic cultural, what do you call it? Conceptual artist, okay. And it was this photocopy that you had copied a, a white piece of paper. I think it was a thousand times, a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And it turned black. Yes, yes. I don't know how many. Wow. <laughs> so That's when amazing. I saw that, it just flipped me out when I was 19 yeah. years old. and. You know, it was very provocative and just sort of like a thumbs up on things that I was wanting to do and and maybe a few of those things since that's, then. That's very but, funny. Uh, where were you? Yeah. Where were you at that time, Alan? That you produced that? What was it? Well, it's a in really interesting story. No one's ever brought this up before. And by the way, I'd like to uh, introduce Todd and Terry on the um, screen here who I'm a real fan. Uh, they have a wonderful show every Tuesday evening called The Large Glass. And I was also a guest on their show a while back. And it's amazingly charming, a kind of update of um, Gertrude Stein's um, Salon, <laughs> Rue de Fleury. Um, so just thanks for coming, Todd and Terry, really appreciate it. But, and John, thank you and Emily for inviting me. This is fabulous. Um, I love having the ability to have a kind of, um, you know, um, kind of community and, and have this informal discussion, but it's wonderful that you brought this Xerox study that I was doing. I was a student at Rhode Island School of Design when I did that project. And I was a confused student because I graduated from high school doing everything the right way, getting all good grades, but I couldn't think on my feet. I was, I was a, you know, I was just not, I, I knew exactly, I memorized facts basically, but I had no idea how to have my own opinions on any topic, whether it was a piece of literature or whatever. So I got to RISD and um, freshman year, I did very badly. I was, you know, freshman foundation, figure drawing, C minuses, C minuses. I was always the, you know, the teacher put the, you know, drawings up on the wall. Mine was always, they always, she always put them in best to worst, which is not a great pedagogical idea. But mine was always the last one on the on the wall. <laughs> so then I, I realized something's wrong here. And I kind of decided, you know, maybe I should just quit and forget architecture, forget, forget the studies. And I started really loosening up. And I learned how to be bad, a bad boy. Um, and then when sophomore year, I, I entered into the School of Architecture and had a few faculty members who were really encouraging and really liked these bad drawings. And um, so I was at I'm, I was confused. And so then I, I discovered the Xerox machine. Um, and, um, I, um, and so I would go to the uh, Xerox copy shop on Thayer Street in Providence, Rhode Island. And um, I did a lot of projects. So I would go there and one project I did, I said, I gave him a blank sheet of paper and I said, Xerox this piece of paper. 
And of course they were confused, but you know, I paid for it and I said, I'd like my receipt. Then I hand them the receipt and I said, Xerox the receipt. And then they were <laughs> the receipt. And I did that kind of projects, but I noticed the Xerox machine had some, you know, background noise or dirt on it. And so I kept then having them Xerox the Xerox of the Xerox until it turned black. So it was a kind of great. So it was the dirt. It, it, was, the, all the, it was the dirt. It was the dirt, dirt on the lens. It. Um, you don't notice it for the first Xerox, but if you keep re-Xeroxing the same page, um, you know, you keep Xeroxing the Xerox, it, it, get, it slowly turns dark and gray and black. So, okay, so I, I'm so very excited Alan, about the idea of mass production, one of a kind, the handmade versus machine. So what I've been hearing from your interviews uh, that I've been reviewing, you know, this past week and today, is that that dirt on that Xerox machine was something provocative. It was something mm. that um, a germ that germinated in your mind, some kind of fascination, like, well, what is this about? Or what? Mm, exactly. So there's this sort of sense of curiosity and um, an openness to recognizing what's happening in that moment as being part of some project. Mm -hmm. You brought it on board. You didn't try to clean the Xerox machine right, or, right. or white, use white off. What was that right. stuff called? White off? Yeah, right. white out. Sure. White out. Yeah. Well, you didn't <laughs> use the white out, Alan. You went with what was happening. Mm -hmm. Is that a kind of uh, methodology that travels with you in your lifetime? Can you yeah, talk about that? I, yeah, I think the idea of the accident in the mistake was discovered early on and I started to exploit that um, you know um, like just you know um, moving along with the current and not trying to um, you know get in the way of that flow um, and letting the accidents happen and, and it happened um, you know I was studying architecture um, and you know we had certain um, assignments I should say program to do projects and I really tried to avoid building it, you know, proposing any kind of buildings, but work with the idea of could we change the field of architecture without building buildings? Could you make speculative drawings and studies and proposals in which the proposal was the final artifact? I don't know if that answers your question, but it partly came out of the era that I was a student as a freshman and sophomore at RISD, um, during, in 1967, I, I started at RISD through 71 or 72. And it, you know, in the early, um, um, late 60s, of course, we had the Vietnam War. And um, I became involved in the anti-war movement as all of the RISD students did at that time. And I think there was an alignment with that anti-war movement and, and the study of architecture in which um, I was interested in a kind of anti-architecture um, movement. I wasn't the only one. I was um, encouraged by a few faculty members who enjoyed the naive work I was doing. I wasn't very good at drawing and so on, but I really enjoyed being a provocateur and, and irritating, um, and irritating especially faculty who um, were not my allies and, you know, and kind of tried to pressure me to build buildings or to make proposals for buildings. So um, it came out of the, I think it came out of that movement. So, and, and this movement was a kind of idea about um, architecture that was speculative, um, theoretical, um, experimental, um, paper architecture was a, a term that was used back then de-architecture, anti-architecture, non-architecture. I really was pulled toward that direction. I hadn't, as a student, I, was, I didn't really have any experience or any knowledge of fine art or the art world. I fell into it um, in a weird, strange way, but I discovered, um, oh, there goes John, off to the bathroom in the back, or maybe a snack. <laughs> I discovered, um, um, people like Andy Warhol and, um, you know, and I use the story, I, I, you know, I was kind of made the story up that Andy Warhol's initials, A.W. Was, were the same as mine, Alan Wexler. 
And I thought that coincidence was too, too important to ignore. So I wanted to be the Andy Warhol of architecture. So that's kind of how that, you know, those Xerox studies started. Um, you know, I was excited about just everything at that moment. I kind of gave up trying to be good and being a good student. And I wanted to irritate. And I really enjoyed that role. So in a way, you, you offered yourself up as um, a speck of dust on the uh, Xerox machine I to, like to that. the world. Yeah, to, to I the like world. that. I like that. Yeah. I, right. I like to be clever about these things. And so <laughs> please have patience with, with me. <laughs> uh, so th this idea of, a, of, a, of a, like a grain of sand in the oyster. Yeah, an irritant. So this irritant develops into something productive. What's that process about? The, the, the grain of sand, the, mm -hmm. the um, provocateur, the uh, interventionist. And by the way, I just casually threw up a few images before in the screen share. One of them was a community project that you created up in Buffalo, New York, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. Want to just take a minute to talk about that work and maybe that would be great. That would be really great um, because it really comes down. back to a kind of interest in building, non-building, but really building community. Can you put that up on the screen so I have something to look at? Well, um, and I, yeah. I could talk a little bit about that because that's quite a new project done about a year or two ago. Here it comes. Okay. There we are. I'm going to enlarge it. I don't see it. No, no, it's it's um, it's uh, Oh, you haven't the, shared it. Part of the ephemeral, yeah. It's in the ephemeral space, <laughs> the interstitial space where nothing is happening and everything. Oh yeah, is yeah, yeah. And do you want to? Oh, good. Okay, yeah. Leave it on that maybe, um, or that yeah. one. So, yeah, go back to the um, overall project, the one. The overhead shot? No, the one of the, that one. That was good. So okay. um, there's an org, an organization in Buffalo, New York called um, SACRA, which I don't know what the acronym means. That one? Is this, What's is that? This the picture? Is that the right picture? No, the one. Go back one because this is harder to understand. That's the interior of the mobile book mobile for children's books on architecture and construction. So um, the um, Sakura in Buffalo, New York, run by wonderful architect Dennis Mayer, um, was given a, um, an old church in Buffalo, and he, he teaches architecture at University of Buffalo, and asked me to do a project with his students who are and were, um, and still this operates today, were um, people who were on welfare um, on, in social services, uh, often single parents, um, and so he uses this church to help them learn construction skills. So in the church is a full woodworking shop and he has workshops to help those people learn construction skills. Um, so he asked me if I could set up a project that his students the next term could work on. So I had him um, re go back I mean, I had him um, purchase a camper that was built in the probably the mid 60s or something like that, that was in really bad shape. We purchased it through Craigslist in Buffalo and he drove it down to, um, to um, the church called Assembly House. And with a group of um, the, the students who we're learning construction, we built, we gutted the interior and completely gutted it and turned it into a mobile children's library for bo a book mobile for children. Um, and it's a, in the books that we house in this and it's in its, and um, our books on construction and architecture. Um, so, and so what I find most interesting about this whole process uh, this is weird because it's black on the screen here. Um, the the cro the process. This is a this was one of the models I made, um, but I also tried to incorporate and and we brainstormed together with this group of people 
um, on, in social services, um, the process of design and construction and building. So we, we and then um, I didn't want the outside to be messed with except for these added elements, which are shelving, seating, and so on, um, and which those are stored on the interior of the camper when it's being deployed. And then when it comes to a site, the uh, local community comes out and assembles the elements onto the flanges that you see in this photograph in front of you. So, um, so um, yeah, so the, the camper itself had 14 windows in the camp, on the camper. They were all different sizes. So we created this or on um, this curved form, this module that because all the windows were different sizes, I added these flanges to the windows, which allowed all the different size windows to end as a square so that any element I put on one window, we could put it anywhere on the camper. And so it, it becomes a, a kind of organic form in which you could change um, the uh, organization of these extensions, whether they're benches or storage. They also was um, storage for um, children's um, building toys, um, as you can see in some of these elements here. And then the interior, which John showed a while back, um, was gutted and becomes shelving and a desk. So it's basically for parents and their children to go inside and, and um, work with um, construction toys and uh, read books on architecture for children um, and um, so on. So that's how that, but I felt it was really not just about building buildings, but it was about building community. So, um, and, and all of these people who worked on this project were then um, got really good jobs in the construction industry as you know journeyman carpenters and so on. And they're making a living and they're able to support their, their children, often their single parents um, and so on. So I felt really good about this project. How long ago was that? When did that happen? Um, I think it was like two winters ago. It was just before a year before COVID luckily. So I spent like a year, you know, every week or every two weeks, I'd go up there, spend two days and then come back to New York. So as a, you're also an educator and um, part of a, a, you know, a teaching community, um, mm -hmm. a learning community. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why community um, comes up so often in, in, your, in your work, maybe your background, your family? Yeah, well, it doesn't come up that often, but except in my teaching. So um, my teaching, and as Todd knows, because we taught together for a while, um, teaching for me um, is an extension of my practice. And I, and I think of myself as a, um, what Joseph, and I know you, you're a big fan of Joseph Boys, but he talks about, I, I think of teaching as social sculpture. Um, and so I think that's really an important part of my practice, as well as the, 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 the studio life itself. Um, sometimes a studio can be a lonely place, which I love. I love the loneliness and the, and the mystery and the um, spirituality of a studio space where you can be alone, experimenting um, with different kinds of ideas, but also by teaching, it gets you out into the real world to have conversations and to, um, to try to encourage my students to be somewhat of irritants in society that they perhaps can change the world um, through, um, you know, manipulating status quo. So, uh, Alan, I'm just going to screen share a little bit more here. Sure. Um, from your website. And uh, this is a, a little movie I made of your website. Cool. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Do we have it there, Alan? Uh, turn the sound off. So there's a sort of exhausting, you know, amount of work, but also a severely eclectic uh, kind of working. Um, like this, this one here with, with the different bottles and, and tubes running in and out of it. Um, you want me to describe? I could describe a little bit about what that is about. 
It'd be great. I wish I could just blow it up. Uh, I think if you clicked on it, it should blow up. I don't know if oh, you're. No, I'm not. I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm not. I'm not live. Oh, okay. That's fine. Um, yeah. I could describe it. So, um, in Judaism, there is a ritual at the end of the Sabbath, at the transition, the threshold between the Sabbath and the work week. So, at sundown on on Saturday evening. There's a, a service in the synagogue, which is called Havdalah. Um, and to make the, the, to ease the transition from the sacred to the profane or from the, um, the, the Sabbath to the work week, um, Orthodox Jews um, um, pass around what's called a spice box. And these are very ornate, often sterling silver boxes that have these wonderful er, um, smelling herbs um, and spices, and they and they have a beautiful smell, cinnamon and nutmeg and and so on. Um, they're passed around the synagogue um, at the at the cusp of sunset uh, of sunset at sunset on on um, Saturday evening. So I was riffing on I, I because I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish family. I often will riff on my past. Um, I um, so the um, so this was a. Um, it's called a, a um, it's a do it, I'm sorry, it's a, um, it's a kind of interactive spice box where you have these bottles of, you know, McCormick and spices and herbs, they're, they're right off the supermarket shelf. And, they're, um, and then there's a tube inserted in each of these caps and the tube goes to a, a mask, not unlike the masks we wear because of COVID um, and you, there's a little valve that, that crimps the plastic tubing so you could control the smells and make your own recipe for these herbal spice smells. So it's a kind of interactive spice box, somewhat tongue in cheek, but um, very serious at the same time. Well, Alan, it's very interesting. The idea of seeing these connection tubes, you know, that there's this sort of ephemeral connection between the, the spices individually, which, you know, we can smell individually on a table in front of us without the tubes, but you've made the sort of visual connection of that ephemeral material of, right. of, of fragrance, the fragrance. Yeah, so exactly. It's like the fragrance becomes part of the conversation. Right. It, it is interesting as a visual artist, how do we physical, physicalize or how do we how do we make visual smell? I did another project which was called In Shadow of the Wind, in which I'm talking about sun and energy and wind. How do we how do we make sculpture out of wind or or fire or smell? Um, those kind of sense. We know how to do it with eyes and tactility in terms of the three-dimensional and the visual, but smell and taste, well, taste maybe, um, but, but smell and other aspects of the um, environment are, are, are very interesting when you try to visualize them. Well, I don't want to be too esoteric about this, but when we come back to the idea of, of community, there's also this you know, substance that creates a community. And yeah. one can imagine, you know, those tubes connecting people in a society. Oh, absolutely. And so you're, you're, you're wacky. Um, I'm just getting a message here from Piero. Uh, yeah. Okay, Piero is, is checking out for a little while. He's very grateful to have been here. Thanks, Piero. All the best, catch you up soon. Pietro Costa. Um, so this crazy thing um, that I love so much is your coffee, coffee drinking at a table with coffee cups connected to each other. And it's about seeking the level that, the, you know, water, mm -hmm. as you've said, is, the, is an absolutely horizontal material. And so that principle of the horizontality and the gravity mm -hmm experienced collectively at a table where people are sharing fluid, these mm -hmm. cups that are connected with tubes. It's so intensely crazy. I, I love it. 
It's and, interesting uh, that that project is very much about community and um, four people drinking coffee together have to lift the cup simultaneously. So there's a kind of, di there's a conversation, a dialogue amongst, you know, each participant in this quote ceremony or ritual of coffee drinking um, because all four people have to, so it's about democracy. It's about the horizontal, as you said, um, you know, architects are very interested in the idea of the, of the new horizon line and the horizontal, you know, buildings do have to be level and plumb. Um, gravity is a, is a kind of great material to work with. And so water seeks its own level. It's, ba you know, basic like high school physics. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, that, so keep it on that for a second because um, the, the, um, this project, which is called Coffee Seeks Its Own Love, I'm looking, it's a little fuzzy, but it was done in the 80s, I think. Um, it's interesting because I was represented by Ronald Feldman Gallery for many years and had 10 yes. solo exhibitions. I really have fond memories of this project because the opening of the exhibition was on Saturday evening. And, you know, I said, there was one more project I wanted to do. So that morning, before the show, and I was very anxious and nervous about the show, of course, um, I got up in the morning and I drilled four holes in four coffee cups and I ran it down to the gallery before the opening. So it was like a last minute insertion into the exhibition. And this has gotten more press and traveled around the world more than I ever have. In fact, this was recently in an exhibition at the Vet Architecture Biennale in Venice, which just closed about a week or two ago, which, in which the topic of that show is how will we live together? So this is one of the pieces that I had an exhibition at the Venice Architecture Biennale, which is about community as well as some other projects. But this was a very important project for me. If you look at the image on the right, for some reason, there's, it seems like there's a black image over it. Anyway, the one on the right is the idea of the accident. And of course, um, you know, what happens in, as, an, as a maker, and I try to encourage this to my students, is you make work and often you're working furiously and quickly and an accident happens, something breaks, the large glass, for instance, of Duchamp breaks, and then you kind of ride with it and you say, this becomes an opportunity about flux and change and it becomes a more interesting resolution because of an accident. So what happens here, when this coffee cup project, coffee seeks its own level, all of the cups started staining the tablecloth. So after the exhibition ended, I took the tablecloth back to my studio and I built ceramic coffee cups that were the shape of the stains on the tablecloth that would then purify, cleanse, and cover up the stains. So it's all about destruction and creation, accident becoming an opportunity. And it's something that especially with architecture and design, designers and architects thrive on problems. The problems are the media that good architects and designers work with, not against. So a low budget project is an amazingly great project, sometimes better than a high budget project. Gravity, although it sucks, become, creates great buildings, for instance, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I'm always pushing and making work in a kind of fast and furious, kind of like a whirling dervish, hoping that an accident will occur and discoveries will be made. I think scientists work the same way um, in that way, waiting for something to happen. You're trying to wait. Your mind is tuned. You're ready for that accident. It's serendipitous. And then you, you jump on it and you start riffing on it. So um, you know, a, a little bit of a side on, on your conversation about community, but it's also about no, accident. Uh, here's the thing. One of the important things that we're trying to develop on the website and in the Institute for Cultural Activism is a kind of scholarship about ways of working that, in a sense, um, create some guidelines or narrative or structure about what cultural activism is and how... Mm -hmm. It's made. Um, you don't intend to be clever and uh, let's say cover up the stains and purify the stains on the coffee cloth, coffee table cloth because it's a cool idea. It's not as though you rationalize.
realized, oh, that would be a cool idea. It was a, 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 a almost like research. Like, well, what, what mm -hmm. if we go a little further with this? Yes, it's, yes. It's, it's a genuine act of inquiry and mm -hmm. of expanding the uh, experience that you that you've started. So everything seems to be in a in a process of, you know, growing, expanding, um, you know, it, it, rather than the the cool artist who's rationally creating art that has never been made before or something right. along those lines right. of intellectual novelty. I really appreciate that. For me, that's a great compliment. It you know, for me, making art. If you try to make art, it's going to be terrible. But if you try to research, experiment with phenomena, you will make better art. So you don't try to make a good, you know what I mean? It's like, so I really appreciate, I think it is a kind of research. It's experimentation. Sometimes it's dangerous physically as well as intellectually because um, you're coming close to an edge and you can fail. Um, but you take those risks and uh, you see what the implications are and you keep moving closer and closer. It's very much a lot about, you know, like the difference between the astronomer and the microbiologist, you know, looking at the micro and looking at the macro and bouncing between those realms. So um, that's, that's, um, thank you for that, John. Well, you, you can thank me as much as you want, but <laughs> I, I just want to insist on that method of working, that uh, very genuine, pure kind of, of investigation and engagement and immersion in the creative process without an outcome in your mind. Right. That's so important. Yeah. Because you 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 learn to live in the present moment mm -hmm. where everything is interconnected. Yeah. The moment you intellectualize it and conceptualize it, you block off the interconnectivity. Yeah. And you block off the, the, the creative flow. Yes. So I insist on examining that experience together with you. And That's I appreciate really your flattery. I take it to heart. Thank but, you. But um, I think that's, that's something that we really need to, to uh, learn more about and, and sit uh, and become agents of and advocate for. Yeah. You know? yeah. But, but you have some um, reference to John Cage, to Zen Buddhism, to... Mm -hmm. Uh, other uh, sorts of maybe lessons or uh, inner sorts of investigation into what the self is and what perception is and what conditioned uh, mm -hmm. behavior is about. And you tell your students to push, yes. push the work, push yourself, push. Mm. So just go a little deeper into this dimension. Uh, well, Alan, in terms know. of pushing work, I mean, I don't know if people who are not in the, in the art or design world this notion and the critique of saying, can you push it further? You know, I always try to get my students to say, you know, although the project they did is really excellent, assume it's not, assume it's middle of the road. Um, so, and if you then reassign what you've done or reposition the work you've done at a midpoint, then you say, what are the two extremes that you can push it toward? So for instance, if a student's done a project um, and it's, um, you know, it's about color, let's say, you assume it's midpoint and it's neutral gray, then you can push it toward the red, or you can push it toward the green, or you can push it toward the hot, or you can push it toward the cold, or you can push it toward the, um, the, the, the private, or you can push it toward the public. So every element, every time you get to a point in the process, and with, I'm teaching product design, and sometimes it's even a piece of hardware, and you connect two elements together, let's say even two pieces of wood together. The first idea might be a nut and a bolt or a wood screw. And then you say, okay, great idea, but it's middle of the road. Then what's the most extreme way to connect two pieces together? And you can say, well, what, the most extreme way is bubble gum. And the other extreme way is gravity. And or the other extreme way is is um, is a you know a connection across time and space that becomes I don't know uh, you know like on the level of nuclear physics in terms of putting things together. So you know it's a way of thinking and pushing work. I know that if you're you know you painter and you take a brush stroke and then you start to experiment with the pressure of the brush against the canvas, um, but 
But yes, I was very influenced by um, people like John Cage because um, early work that I had done was all was starting to be more about process. I was, um, you know, after graduating from School of Architects, I started making constructions of these small miniature buildings where I would create a miniature lumber yard. And once I had this miniature lumber yard of let's say two by fours and sheets of plywood and glass at miniature scale, I could then take those materials and put them together without hesitation, without thinking. Um, and people looked at the work I was doing and said, oh, it looks like, and I had a very poor background in architectural history. And of course at RISD in the late sixties, there was no such thing as Eastern art and ideas. It was always Western art. We had a class called Western art and ideas. No interest in Eastern art and ideas. So people said, wow, your look, work looks like traditional Japanese architecture. So I started looking at Japanese architecture. Um, and then um, the Japanese tea ceremony became interesting to me. And then I discovered that John Cage was very interested in, in um in sound and um, the sounds that were maybe to our ears atonal. Um, and I started reading his texts like Silent, the book Silence, and it, that flipped me out when I read Silence. And then through that, I became interested in his references to DT Suzuki and Zen Buddhism and how you work without hesitation, without thinking, a kind of um, investigate, you know, how do you work without preconception, without a goal? before you begin the project. You start with an urge, but you don't have a, a final result. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's about um, the process of working. So I'm flipping through some of these images here, Alan, and um, maybe just you know, give us a little narration yeah. of what's going on. Yeah, leave, leave this one on for the moment. This is called Vesicles. Um, this is was a very recent project done about two years ago, also a year before COVID. I was invited by um, a curator, um, um, Julie Courtney, who's a Philadelphia curator, and she's been a big fan of my work and has put me in shows in Philadelphia and so on. Um, she was working with an arts organization in New Jersey called the Wheaton Arts Center, and they have a very good glass blowing facilities. And she wanted to put together a group of five artists who had never worked in glass to put together an exhibition in which the work would be, would be blown at this facility, Wheaton Art Center, which is in Millville, New Jersey, near Glassblow, which was the center of glass blowing, one of the centers of glass blowing in the United States. And so I never worked in glass. Um, a little bit of sheet glass, window glass, but nothing that was organic form. So. Of course, I got really nervous. I'm not that young and you're, you, know, you get set in your ways and, and you're comfortable in your studio. And I love my table saw and my band saw and my planners and joiners, but I never worked in glass. So this gave me the opportunity to push myself and become a beginner again, you know, and, and not to be so, um, you know, and it kind of pushed me beyond what I was used to and familiar with. So it was a wonderful experience working with master glass blowers. Um, and then of course, because I wasn't physically blowing the glass and my, I'm a maker, I love building. I had to take the glassware back to my studio and continue to work on it. So then I would take it back to my studio, learn how to use a carbide um, drill bits and drill into the glassware and attach you know, valves and faucets and externalize internal organs and where these um, conveying devices um, using um, these glass forms. So I did a whole body of work. I spent about a year going back and forth to New Jersey working with these glass blowers, and it was a, a wonderful opportunity, but but really scary, um, I must say. Oh, John, I think you're you're muted. Uh, I wanted to share perhaps the video of you at the glass blowing place, which I oh, yeah. enjoyed seeing. Should we just take a look at that quickly? Sure. Um, let me see where it is. Yeah. See it?
So Ellen, what are we seeing? Oh, okay. So, um, um, you know, I was, I work in mostly wood. So I discovered that there is a, a, a process in glass blowing in which you create a, gla a mold and you blow glass into a negative mold. The traditional molds that were used in glass blowing, you would take a cherry tree, log, you know, log, like, a, like, like that big, and you would split it in half and you carve out a vessel form on the inside of this cherry tree. And then using leather, you'd create a hinge. So I got very excited about this idea of the molding. And so, but I could make molds in wood and then they could blow into these forms. So it was a way for me to create a balance between my skills in woodworking and the, glass the skill of the glass blower and incorporate those two. So I did a series of glass forms that started with the highly pixelated vessel form, which is basically a cube with a, with a, a cubic um, spout. And then slowly I added more and more pix I should say pixels or planes to it until I approached the kind of traditional vessel form. And so um, what you do is you make those, so I made those vessel forms in cherry plywood as planes and then fiberglass the outside because the, the, the heat, which is over 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, would have instantly melted the glue that holds those planes together. But the um, fiberglass held them together so you can make you know, four or five or six or seven mold, um, um, cast vessels from each mold. Um, but I was interested in taking those molds which is the process of making the glassware, and then later making those molds become the, became the carrying cases for the fragile glassware. So the thing that makes the thing. So I made the mold, right. the mold produced the glassware, and then the mold was used to protect the glass forms. But the whole series starts with a cube and slowly becomes, it's almost like slowly becomes more and more refined until it becomes an organic form, a curvilinear form. So it was a sequence of kind of geometries of those molds. Yeah, by the way, Emily's work with, the, with blown glass constituted the glass blower inhaling and exhaling one oh. breath into yeah. molten glass. And the form nice. of it is quite similar to these forms we're seeing here. Yeah, yeah. Almost yeah. as though it's an externalized organ right. from the body but, uh, yes. was this, formed that's, by, that, by, by the breath. That's right. In fact, you know, I was really interested. And of course, we know Marcel Duchamp's breath, is it um, French air or quote, fresh air? which is a vial of French. So maybe I was riffing on that, but also like Emily, I got fascinated by, by um, Skitch, who was the master glass, were blowing a bubble of molten glass into a form. And then I took that glassware back to my studio. I blew my breath into his breath. And I wore that thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's another piece in the series called Breath. And then there's another one called Breathe. And those kind of two variations from Breath and breathe and the glass blowers are overlap with the with my breath and future breaths reminded me of the Japanese tea bowl in a weird way I'm coming full circle um, where the tea master puts his fingerprints into the tea bowl and you know five generations later the great 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 grandson or granddaughter tea master places his or her hands on the tea bowl, overlapping the hands of the, his or her ancestor. There's that, conf, con, uh, and this is something very much about, because I'm teaching product design now, how do products create that transition from generation to generation and also convey meaning and tell stories. So that became very interesting to me, is the maker's breath and the user's breath and overlapping those two. You know, for me, trained as an architect and as a 
as a functional artist or an applied artist, I'm interested in the other side of architecture and the other side of design, which is a soft, poetic, spiritual side of architecture and structure. So it's the difference between fine art and applied art. And I'm, I really like it when my work is balanced precisely on the edge between those two realms. Uh, Alan, I, I wanna share uh, further um, a very nice uh, excerpt from a video that was produced by a friend of yours or a colleague of yours. Maybe you can, uh, mm. just here's the screen share. Here's, a, here's Alan in a film about Alan. Mm. Fail. And you have to fail once a day to be a great artist or a great designer. That's really important. You need to learn how to fail. And you have to fail once a day <laughs> to be a great artist or a great designer. That's really important. <laughs> um, let's see if we can go on. Yeah, hold on. Sorry. Can I stop? It's hard when you're teaching at a university level to get your students to fail. It's really tricky. <laughs> Yeah, well, let's talk about that in a minute. Here. My work is about that. It's, I wouldn't say my work is, is architecture. I used to think it was, but now I really feel that I am an artist, but the medium I'm working in is architecture. That is the material I work with. Some people work with clay, some people with pigment, some with stone. My material, is architecture, is program, eating, sleeping, bathing, earth, air, so fire, the water. I have two degrees, one from a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Rhode Island School of Design. Sleeping, bathing, earth, air. I just want to stop there for a moment, Alan, and just to acknowledge that you've done some very large site specific and architecturally you know, sort of um, in dimension, architecturally quite large projects. And um, can you hear me? Yes, sure. So um, what is it that we're seeing here? Where, where are we and what's, what's going okay. on here? Um, yeah, I would like to acknowledge Ellen Wexler who's in the audience. And we collaborate on public art and uh, other kinds of commissioned work. Um, and this was one that Ellen and I did for the Hudson River Park. It's located on 29th Street along the Hudson River. It's called Two Two Large Tables. And so it's really about this conflation between sculpture and architecture, function and non-function, two horizontal planes, one at 30 inches off the ground and the other at seven feet off the ground. In each case, they're supported by 13 chairs. In each case, the 13 chairs are positioned exactly the same as in the other Piece. So one acts as a shade pavilion and one acts as a table. Um, the table is cut because I create, we, you know, we did this project, we create a problem. The table's too big for conversation, 16 feet square. It's not a very good idea for making a table. So then we have to solve the problem of community and conversation. So then we cut into the tabletop to allow people to enter from different places, from different locations, different mindsets, they end up sitting facing each other in these niches. The chairs hold up the table. So you feel like your energy travels through the surface of the table to another person sitting at another side on that table because the furniture is the support um, in each of these cases. In the case of the shade pavilion, the backs go up and, and support the roof. And in the case of the table, the back support the table top. And that is there now. You can, you can go visit that piece at Hudson River Park. So, you know, Ellen and I have done some, and we also did a project for the Atlantic Terminal in Brooklyn, which was a site-specific sculpture um, that incorporates the architecture into our piece. 
So would you like to go back to a couple of these other works, Alan? Um, sure. We flashed up before. Um, let's just see, I'm sorry, let's see. Yep, okay. Yeah, for example, the bicycle. Oh yeah, the bicycle for picnicking. Right. You, are you pulling that up? You're, gonna, you're looking for it. Um, wait a minute. Yeah, that's it right there. Yep. Yep, there it is. No. Keeps putting some like a black square over the image. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, So there seems to be some sensibility of, of, about uh, deconstruction mm. again, and, and, and again, yeah. the, the component parts that are related in some abstract or e e ephemeral space. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a, um, you know, I, I think we could talk about absurdity, um, which is what, you know, I, you know, is this a functional bicycle that carries a picnic basket on it? Or is it really talking about the life of a picnicker and breaking down the continuity of some ordinary action into finite pieces, like looking at the each frame of a slow motion film, you know, like a Moybridge photo, you know, sequence of images showing every step. So what I do is, is make people aware of the, what is existing in their own lives presently by looking at them as, pieces that are then reassembled as a totality. So um, this is not really a functional bicycle for picnicking, but it does speak to the idea of continuity in one's life, eating a meal. Um, I, this really riffs a little bit on a project I did in 1990 called Crate House that had gotten a lot of press. Um, and um, and it's a, um, in which I took a, the idea of a house, and I made four rooms, a bedroom, kitchen, bathroom, and um, living room. And each of those rooms is in a crate. And each crate slides into an eight foot cube, but can only fit one room at a time. So like in the Japanese house, at nighttime, the entire eight foot cube becomes a bedroom. During the daytime, the bedroom rolls out of the cube and the kitchen or the living room rolls into the cube and activates that space. But they're each built into a crate that is um, precious, it's protecting our own everyday life. It's a bit of a kind of Duchampian urinal, except my work returns it back to being somewhat functional. Um, so it's looking at the everyday um, as if it's a, in that case, it was like a dot, you're looking at a diorama at a museum of natural history. I'm not sure I'm explaining that very well without having a photograph for you guys to see. What are, what are these, what are these, um, what are these situations here, Alan? This is a brand new project done last summer. So I'm, I'm really glad you're showing some of the newer work. Um, it's called Light Table. Um, and um, I, I, um, spent the past year or two exploring um, a book which is called the Futurist Cookbook. Um, I'm not sure some of you may, who have a background in art history may, have the, uh, may, under, may know of the Italian futurists um, who were in the teens, very excited about new technology. They were excited about war. I mean, I have a mixed love-hate relationship because they were also fascists. Um, they love the energy of war and military. Um, but they, but they were the urban impressionists. You know, you had the, ur the impressionists who rendered nature and light, but the futurists were really interested in electricity and noise yeah. and um, and um, vibrancy and vibration and movement. Um, so uh, Marinetti, who was kind of an instigator of the futurist, yes. is a poet. Yes. Um, yes. um, and he, after, you know, in 1932, somewhat after the beginning of the um, Futurist movement, actually published a book called The Futurist Cookbook of Absurdist Dinner Parties. 
And so I started saying, I wanted to reinvent the Futures Cookbook using exactly the same graphic language as the original one, but update the dinner parties with my own work. So this came out of that study of the Futures Dinner Party in which um, transparent dinnerware has light sources underneath them. So when you eat in the darkness, you illuminate the food. And so if you cut a cucumber and slice it thin, you get this beautiful cross section through, through everyday food. And also it tends to color the light in the atmosphere of that quote restaurant, like a futurist restaurant. Um, so I, so I did a whole series of proposals. The new work I'm thinking about is um, working with collaborating with a person who's really knows technology and, and comes out of being a sound artist, um, collaborating and doing a project about um, where if you lift a, a fork or a spoon, I don't know if you know what a theremin is, but the sound waves would be transformed by just eating an ordinary dinner and that they would create a soundscape. So we're kind of thinking about that. Could you make a dining room table like the body of a violin where it's shaved and the thinness of the top membrane of a tabletop would reverberate when you placed a, a coffee cup on a tabletop or a, a wine glass? Could it create a, a reverberation in the space? Well, there's also this, this um, implication somehow visually for me of the you know, World Trade Towers being demolished and people, thousands of people being killed. Oh. And, and now mm. that we have the light towers. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And yeah. so it was very evocative to me of, of that um, experience. Of, right. In this case, what's really cool is that <clears throat> the more you eat, the more light that's interesting. I didn't think of that. That's excellent. Yeah. I so like that. It's a light sculpture. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, many years ago, and I think I should return to this. I mean, you've given me a good idea for my next project. I did a project called um, Building it's with... It's all same price, Alan. Building same price. with... It yeah. was a building. Very long time ago, I did this. It was a, it was a scale. It was a small version. It was a, like a maquette, but meant to be no bigger than the mat, you know, an actual work in itself. But it was a building that, with chairs that, that came up again. The chairs were windows and you, the windows were chairs that were set flush with the building when you sat around a dinner table. So the idea was as you pulled your chairs into the building to eat dinner, your bodies would create a dark space. So similar project, it's called Building with Window Chairs. I, I'm pretty sure it's on my website, but it was probably from the 80s that I did that. This is a, a piece that was also at the Venice Architecture Biennale, How Will We Live Together? And this is about the, oh, did, John, did you wanna say something? You were muted. You're, you're muted, John. Uh oh, John, can you hear me? You're telling us about the, the uh, Venice Architecture Biennale. Yes, it, well, this was also exhibited at the Venice Architecture Biennale. Um, um, and it's also, how, how will we live together? It's about the guest and the host and the work of the, get, of the host for the sake of the guest. Also riffing a little bit on the spirit of the Japanese tea, tea room or the tea mat, to the, the tea master serving and expending energy to make this wonderful tea and ceremony and comfort and retreat for the guests and not partaking in the tea. There's that kind of giving of oneself to your guest, uh, an act of humility and, and carrying the weight of this table. It's interesting that you have those references, Alan. And when I look at this, I, I think of, um, of, of the tea service as well, but also the idea of gravity Mm -hmm. and counterbalance and physics for sure and and manners yeah yeah <laughs> i mean it it's um you know one it, it evokes in my own mind the idea that you know if you're in a bad mood um in your work okay there's this persistent point of view which is as though who's watching the bad mood who's mm -hmm. watching the anger who's watching yes. 
the neurotic patterning mm-hmm. and who's allowing those patterns to deconstruct and to unravel and to become component parts that might be redesigned for a new vision of ourself or of society. Yeah, excellent. Uh, and community. Exactly. So these are things that go through my mind. I know we, we share a certain sensibility being of the Duchampian, Boisean, mm-hmm. Ronald Feldman yeah. yes. uh, club. Yes, um, it is a club. Now I think <laughs> a, a number of other people here, like Babette, uh, who's in the background in the kitchen there in Amsterdam, and Margaret, who's leaning up against her elbow, mm-hmm. you know, creating another structure with her arm and chin. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there might be some input from this very gifted community, uh, people who might, might want to talk with you now. So Great. we're turning it Love over. That. And Elaine, hello to Elaine, who Elaine has just got this audio wallpaper in the background, you know, she's, mm-hmm. um, she's there in the ephemeral space. Uh, maybe she's smelling the pepper on her table. We don't know. It's, it's interesting, this idea of community, John. Um, this is the last comment I'll make before and we open up to the public. But, um, you know, in no, you know, a year and a half ago or two years ago, no one knew what Zoom was about. All of a sudden, March 12th or something, Parsons closed down. We all had to go remote. We had to learn about um, social distancing and Zooming and remote teaching and learning. And I got really interested in, could we create a community using Zoom? And of course, then all of a sudden we have these amazingly inventive people out there like orchestras doing these amazingly poetic, beautiful performances of you know, musical compositions where people are in their own homes playing instruments and really coming together in a beautiful way. If you remember uh, Marcel, not Marcel, um, 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 understanding Marsha McLuhan talked about the global village and the future, you know, the idea of right. the global village using technology that at that time it was cable television, you know, porta pack units and cable TV. What an, what a, um, you know, and w- we're living this today. We have the ability to have community across the globe. So I want, I once did this project and this is also very Duchampian. And in fact, it literally is Duchampian. I took, a ceramic coffee cup and I dropped it on the ground from one meter off the ground in memory of Marcel Duchamp's three standard stoppages. If you're an art historian or whatever, you would know that project. Anyway, it broke into, um, yeah, three standard stoppages. It broke, it, the cup broke into, I don't know, 16 fragments. I took each fragment and glued them onto a white paper cup. And then my idea was, I would ship those coffee cups to 16 people around the globe. And there was a whole performance based on that. And then at a certain time, and and at a certain time, you know, all 16 participants from different parts of the globe, different time zones would get on Zoom and we would drink coffee from the same coffee cup simultaneously to create that kind of community. Because I wanted to be able to pass a coffee cup you know, I'm seeing John on my left, but I, my hand is not going through. I wish it could so we could shake hands or he could pass me a cup of coffee or a glass of wine. We could drink together. So that was my solution to Zooming a coffee, you know, coffee drinking ritual. Anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, it's very beautiful because the first broadcast in September of 2020 from Minneapolis, from the Trilon Theater, um, Ann Waldman was one of our guests, the oh, first wonderful. guest of the first show. Babette was there. And um, during that show, we talked about having a sanctuary page where people mm. could come to our website. And, and in the process of this conversation, Meredith Monk offered us her anthem. Oh, love which, Meredith Monk. Which was, which was con- constituted a, a concert in maybe 50 different f- fragments around the world. Nice. So uh, thanks to, you know, Meredith for, for that very generous offer. Wow. And uh, there it is on our website. So, yeah, I mean, it's the hunger for community, Ellen, that um, was the engine for a lot of stuff that uh, Emily and I have been doing for a few years. 
having these kinds of immersive, uh, interactive, participatory events, you know, and um, well, let's not get in the way of other, other people's uh, input here. Um, Babette just had a, a show, isn't it? A film about um, Buddhism. Uh, what's the title of the film, Babette? And, and it just showed in the Buddhist Film Festival and maybe say hi to Alan. And uh, Margaret works in oddly similar ways with, with you, Alan. I think both of these folks would, would love to have some, you know, uh, exchange here. And Sally Harris said something a little mischievous can we hear what's behind uh, his skirt or glasses? I don't know what that means, Sally, but it's very fluxus. Yes. What's, what she's <laughs> saying, Sally, can we hear what's behind his skirt of glasses? Oh. His, his glass it, skirt. So yeah, yeah that so was exactly. the, you, you went, you showed a video of me wearing a skirt <laughs> that had um, glasses and it was making a soundscape. Um, it was called um, Glass Armonica, I think. That so if that's, if that's a request. That's what it's about. I was thinking of these reading glasses. <laughs> but me too. I was no, that was, that's a reference. It's no, a clanking dinnerware. I thought she was referring to Babette's skirt, and I had no idea what that was. Okay. So, yeah, it was about that but, little video that you showed before. Happy to play it on request at the end of the show. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a, a beautiful little video with the Beatles, Let It Be, playing yeah. backwards. You know, it's interesting, that piece, I had no intention to make that piece as a sound piece. I made the piece as a way of transporting glassware, you know, conveying glassware. And yet when I put it on, it made the most beautiful soundscape. So um, it was a nice uh, accident that happened. Thank you. Well, Babette, you have your microphone open. Uh, yeah. I Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you, Babette. Thank you, Alan. And um, yeah, good listening to you. Uh, before I share a little bit about my film that is just going on in America now, I wanted to uh, respond to a few things that you said, especially, you know, uh, of course, we all share the love for John Cage, I think, you know, and um, uh, I, both of us, John and I, had have some past with him, you know, worked with him, had the, the chance of working with him. But what I also found fascinating is that you were mentioning the Thurman. Uh -huh. uh, I, I once worked on a film with Thurman and I brought him to Holland at wow. age four. Really? Uh, he was 94 years old. Wow. Uh, I brought him to a museum in The Hague and... Um, you know, it's he's such a fascinating guy. And besides inventing the Thurman, he was really an inventor. And wow. I don't know, know that he really invented the um, the gliding stairs or the you know the opening of the elevators and stuff. Oh. And so he actually got kidnapped by the KGB and was put to work in a labor camp by You're Stalin. Kidding. Really. Because invented the, the the listening thing from the telephone that's his was his job then at the wow. time and uh, when i brought him here uh, i had invited him because i was so interested in the academy of light that he had been participating in in the early wow. like the 1920s or it's called the academy of light and actually skriabin the composer and all these guys they were part of that wow and, and little did do many people know, you know, they all know the Thurman and the Beach Boys and how they use that, right? Mm -hmm. How they use that, that um, sound equipment. But he actually came to America uh, in the 30s. And you know that you could walk in New York, you can imagine, and I think it was 37 or something. He actually made the first tactile um thing on a on a floor you would just walk on an um, on the street and suddenly the floor would catch in a little bit wow. and it would do sound the sound Fabulous. you would be walking wow. and you oh wouldn't know where the sound would be coming from so great this guy, this guy did that all wow you know Amazing. and it's i think he was uh, just incredible 
He died about two years later after he came here. And he uh, was always talking to me saying that he was had found the invention of how time functioned. Uh, you know, he was claiming that when he was 94 years old. And I wow. kept saying to everybody, write it down. <laughs> write down yeah. what he's saying. Because <laughs> you know, Fantastic. You know, <laughs> the guy is mm -hmm. uh, But anyway, it ended up that I had to uh, uh, wheelchair him to the um, <laughs> to Schiphol Airport. Putting wow. a Putting a thousand dollars on his body, you know, like under his shirt, because he said, "When I'm going back, they're going to take all the money <laughs> that I'm making here." And oh, uh, wow. so we put up his gaffer tape on his body. He was oh my really god, to sneak a it through! A, a rebellious guy, such wow, a that's that's a, this, this, great story. You have to, you have to, I bet you have to write another book, Babette. Absolutely. <laughs> but anyway, that's Thurman. Uh, you know, he was wow. really something. The wow. first, the, really the first, what I would call the first interactive, um, you know, uh, installation works actually yeah. on street. And he also wow. married a, a black woman, right? I don't wow. know if he, he married a black Extremely woman. Extremely unusual. Wow. Really unusual. Amazing. Guy. Really wonderful. Uh, that's the guy who you were talking about. The oh term. My God. Yeah, the term. In. Wow. He's a man. And, this um, really feels like a dinner party, John. This is what happens. <laughs> One thing leads anyway, to another. Anyway, I think the woman, yeah. the woman who was talking before, she's absolutely right. That piece that you did with the glass, very fluxus like, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. it, it's the between the the sound of the concrete sound almost like the you know like um Russolo or those brothers mm. would in, oh, in the yeah. you know the italian guys yeah the futurist the futurist musician yeah. exactly the futurist you know, music. yes yeah. you know, yes Babette, the, the yeah. woman who made the comment about the glass skirt yeah if she were not if she had not been in existence then emily harris would not be here because oh, that's yes. her mother that's her mother. Wow. Oh, that's her mother. Wow. Yeah, that's that's Sally Harris. Wow. Out in Minnesota, oh. Afton, Minnesota, to be exact, on the stagecoach trail. Yes. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's um, enjoyable to listen and forgive me, I'm so tired. What time and, is it there? Um, it is. Um, 11.30? Uh, um, 11.30. Yeah, six hours later. Almost midnight. And wow. I had my grandmother day today, so I have to get up at six in the morning. Oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, anyway, being a grandmother is a great, you know, well, blessing. I'm, I'm a grandfather and it can't be better. Yeah, it's, it's, amazing. it's so amazingly beautiful. But sorry, I don't want to get into that. But, you know, I'm too <laughs> yes. tired. Actually, I enjoyed listening. and uh, Thank you. Appreciate it. Great story. Yeah. We were with Babette and Margaret uh, back in, in October uh, for four days. It was a great, great time. Oh. And we met also with, um, with Carl uh, Geskis, part of the Free University. Of, uh, you remember Free International University, yeah. Alan? Yeah. So there's a lot of depth in our community and through the tuning fork, we're introducing people to other people, and mm. it's just been such a great, a great, actual, live, living community in action, not just on mm. the internet. Cool, that's really great, Margaret. I can't understand why you are not chiming in here. <laughs> what pressure? <laughs> I, I, I pressure. need to. Well, <laughs> I need to. I I don't know who I I said that to the other day, but. Uh, when on Zoom, I kind of never know when to start to talk. It's like, it's good to get an invitation, you know, to be invited into the room. So, uh, Alan, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation. And there is somehow a lot of, uh, a lot of parallels. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I've worked in Japan also on several occasions. And um, I worked together with... Uh, um, 
Japanese tea ceremony master, a woman. Really? Uh, yeah. So she is from a very famous family. She's from the Enshui Kobori family. Um, I don't know if you're familiar What's it with called? there's Enshui Kobori. And so, so her father is, I believe, a 16th generation. And as a woman, she is normally not allowed to, you know, to be the successor. But uh, her brother is not so interested in the tea ceremony. So finally, now she's becoming a successor. Excellent. But the crazy thing also is that um, she got married to an American. And now they have two children together, which, of course, at first was completely like impossible because she has to have a son so that the son can be a successor. But then the son is not purely Japanese. So she's a real rebel. But. <laughs> but Very so tricky. I work, yeah. So I worked with her on several occasions, and actually, yeah. What we did, we kind of uh, challenged the. Um, so the piece was called "Absence of the Tea Master." So we challenged the, you know, the authority of the tea master, and like the very strict kind of breaking the rules kind of thing. Um, so we replaced the tea ceremony master uh, with a dancer. And the tea ceremony master was part of the participating oh. public. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. So, yeah. So, anyway, so I'm also doing a lot of uh, uh, participatory work. And like when you were talking about, uh, you know, like breaking or allowing for accidents to happen, um, it made me think of like the reason or the, like when I start to work with the public. So I don't know what, so I do these, these participatory performances or sometimes interactive installations. Uh, so I make a framework, but I don't really know what happens. And I love that because mm. it's, I mean, I could never like think of that, right? So I, I open up the space for the other people and I just kind of, mm. you know, let it happen. And Wonderful. Yeah, 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 that's beautiful, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, teaching is a little bit like that too. You set up a prompt mm -hmm. and then you let them go. And then mm -hmm. it's exciting because you never know um, how it will evolve into the, throughout the semester. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm also teaching. Now I'm teaching uh, students in uh, Singapore at the moment. And oh. uh, yeah, and they, so I'm, uh, I'm doing critical studies because it's online teaching. So mm -hmm. it obviously it would be, you know, difficult to, to, to work on like physical projects, oh, yeah. but um, they are talking a lot about uh, the pressure that they are under and that they don't understand. I mean, why they have that they, they don't and they say, well, we cannot. Do, why do we have to produce so much? And why do we have to be under so much pressure? We mm -hmm. cannot really create or, uh, you know, like what you're talking about, like to have mm -hmm. the freedom to. Uh, to make an accident. I mean, that's also a question of time, right? Like when we don't yeah. have the time to just, you know, just allow whatever time we need until maybe something appears, right? <laughs> well, something, I, I don't know. I think yeah. the pressure of time um, is actually a good thing because you don't, when you have a deadline, I tell my, try to tell my students this, they don't always believe it. But when you have a deadline, you don't have time to justify something out of existence. So you just go with uh -huh. it because you don't yeah. have a lot of time. So I often yeah. set up a project where the time is really limited. And then yeah. it's about slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, mm -hmm. you know, that because it forces those accidents. So uh, something about the pr provocative aspect of a deadline that um, evokes concentration and prioritizing. Eh? Yeah. No, it's so not, true. not so much about the product, not so much about mm -hmm. the product, but mm -hmm. becoming familiar with, with the process of yeah. discovery no, it, and, and it, perception. It, no? Yeah. Anyway, I apologize. I because think Todd has a, Todd has a Todd, question. Todd, yes. Todd over here. Todd, and thanks for being with us, Todd. It, it's so great, Margaret. Hey, you should really listen in on, on um, the, the large glass, which of course is also a Champion reference. Every Tuesday Thank night in a few hours. <laughs> thanks, Alan. I, um, I actually thought of something. Well, thanks for this great presentation, by the way. I've, I've loved listening to you. Um, and I thought of something 
that I wanted to ask. It's an aspect of your work that I, we didn't address. And given that we're talking about Duchamp and you brought up three standard stoppages and we're talking about fluxus and cage, and I don't think we often talk about this with any of them, but in your work, there's such a um, emphasis on the container or the box mm. or the like, so shovel and case 2019 or the, mm. the bicycle for picnicking. The, the containers that actually hold these objects and and the and what they do. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on those. Like I have some ideas. Mm. I mean, I like those things as well in my own work, but yeah. I'm curious how you sort of feel about those and the importance they assign. I really would love to hear your thoughts on that more than mine. The first time I well, I met Todd before, but he had this show and and I didn't have any, it, he did a, a show about my work and I wasn't participating, but I was in the audience. It was really interesting, so profound because you picked the work and you discussed it. And I learned so much from that conversation you had with, with Terry together about my work and I wasn't there. And then later on, you invited me as a, as a live guest. So um, it's always wonderful to hear other people speaking about someone's work without the person being there. You know what I mean? So I'm wondering what your thoughts on those boxes, because I'm not quite sure um, you well, know, why I do that, except it, it makes a neat package and contains, it's almost like a frame. It's like why a frame around a picture, because it sets it from the, the environment surrounding it. And there's a stage for it, maybe the box like a stage. Yeah, I, you know, I think of Bois en Valise. Um, mm -hmm. I think of Cage's uh, catalog for Roly Holy over a circus, which was the retrospective he had at the Philadelphia, I believe, at the Philadelphia Museum. Also in a box, it was ephemera. Oh, in a box. I don't know. And um, it's it's kind of a um, I don't know whether it comes out of a kind of insecurity, but it it, it implies a kind of importance to box something, to collect something and put it into a, a space like that. It emphasizes the area around it, right? It kind of gives an importance mm. to what holds that thing. Yeah. And somehow, like a vitrine in a museum, like we talked about when I was talking about your work, we did talk about the vitrine and how it kind of gives, it, it elevates an object to a place of importance. But the box mm. is different because it's more of a, it protects, um, it archives, it, it, um, it, it organizes, right? But when you have a bicycle for picnicking, for example, you, you could very simply attach a large box to the back of a bicycle, put all the objects in it and yes. go. Right. But, but you've chosen in this case to make a box for every object, which then elevates each object to this really interesting kind of mm. um, place. Um, it assigns an importance to each one of those. Yeah, very all of, much all so. Of the objects in the spice box uh, on the table, how they each have this kind of connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I'm just, I guess I'm just no, trying. It's so to true. It's really it like looking at the frames of a film and breaking apart and cutting them apart and just looking at each frame. So it's about continuity and discontinuity. And I think the box is a framing device. Yeah. It's a space between things which is the gap, which That's creates it. energy. Yeah, I remember the first time I was at Parsons and I saw, for those of you that have never seen this, in there's a building at Parsons uh, and on, the, on one of the fine arts floors or the architecture floor, I think it's fine arts, but there's a handle on the wall. And if you walk up and grab the handle, you can roll out this entire portable kitchen. It rolls oh. out in a big box as if out of a magical space. Yeah on the floor and then when you open it up alan has constructed an entire space to have a reception for an exhibition there are wine mm -hmm. glasses there are kitchen objects mm -hmm. and then it all folds up each object has its own little place yes and it appears in the wall it's fantastic yeah, yeah. it's fantastic thank you thanks for the well you know it's uh i think it goes to that box thing as well but anyway that mm -hmm. was my that was my thought i appreciate yeah. It's about, yeah, it's, it's really like um, when you have something in a box and you have to open it up, you have, you're looking at, it's like slowing our lives down and making us look more closely at the world around us. For me, it's eating, sleeping, bathing, and just looking at the finite elements of life. Yeah. The preciousness of objects, you know, a gift, it's like a gift. 
There's a lane. Hey, Elaine. Hey, Elaine. You're muted, Elaine. Are you speaking? <laughs> I've known Elaine for how many years were you at? Feldman? 89, since 89. 89 years. You're not that old. I'm 89 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine is wonderful. Thank you. Great to see you. It's nice to see you too. It's great to hear you both talking, all talking. So, Ellen, I, I have one more question. I have a question. Is there feedback here? Yes, there is. <laughs> okay. Oh. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that as you are speaking about your work, and I um, um, was looking at that table and had read somewhere how you were thinking about tables as passive planes. Mm. And um, so you wanted to make this passive plane of the table into something active. So you put it, you strapped it to a person. And um, some quirky idea that just came to me is that um, it's almost as if you're not allowing for any wallflowers. Every, every object, everything, you're like taking them and activating as part of your process. And, yeah. um, and it relates to me also as, as kind of like um, a Cajun idea where in silence, um, every sound is, a, is, a, is an acknowledged amplified. sound. Yeah. I can't hear Alan for some reason, oh. but, um, oh yeah. Sorry, there's, there's difficulty here with being in the same room. But um, anyway, I love that about your work, Alan, that you're Thank activating you, every, like, like um, these, there are these stages that you're creating and, mm. and, and you're, you're performing and creating, I don't know, that's all. That's, no, I love what you're yeah. saying. But the table itself, the spirit of the table is elevating the everyday and floating it above the earth's surface. So the table is a plateau. Um, there were so many years, and Elaine will remember this, where I, I worked with the chair as a kind of canvas, raw canvas, which implied human occupancy. Um, and then I realized people would typecast me and said, oh, he's the chairman. He's doing a lot of chairs. For me, the chair was not about chair. It was about the person projecting themselves into this space of the chair. So then I started working on just tables because they were very neutral. A table could be scaled up and become a landscape. A table could be scaled down and become micro, you know, that kind of thing. It's more abstract. It's a horizontal plane held up with four legs, columns. Um, so I, I really like that. For me, a table is more like tofu. It absorbs flavor. Whereas a chair, you immediately identify it with sitting. So that I moved away from the chair as a device to experiment with ideas. Alan, can you talk about the large table that you made and uh, during the opening, everyone sat? Oh, they yeah. found their path into yes. the table. To yeah, sit. that was... That was that really was great. And that was one of my favorite photographs I did at the gallery. And I think you were one of the people in that photograph because we had, we pulled people together for fun. So the first version of that table, which is now the version in stainless steel at the Hudson River Park on 29th street, I did as an exhibition at Ronald Feldman Gallery. And um, I know John is a big fan of Ron. He was an incredible supporter of my work and such a wonderful spirit. Um, but so there was an exhibition I did called um, um, Tables, Buildings, Landscapes, I think it was called. Anyway, one of the elements in that show was the version of that table done in plywood with Ikea chairs supporting up this horizontal plane. Um, and that became the, the, in a way, the prototype or the first version of the one I did, Ellen and I did for the Hudson River Park in stainless steel. And it was at the Feldman Gallery. Um, and there were lots of other table projects in that show. Um, tables, 
um, all different kinds of versions of tables and tableness and community and so on. So, so Alan, I'm I'm actually curious to to hear a bit more about this large table because you were mentioning that uh, the people, I mean, the distance is quite uh, large, right? I mean, big between the chairs, mm -hmm. so that means that the people cannot really communicate with each other. So, yeah. the so um, how did you? I mean, how did was there a need to kind of kind of solve that or uh, yeah. Would, okay. yeah hold on for a second I have a I'll, I'll pull a model of it so I'm in my studio in New York so here is the original model mm -hmm. that I did for that table um, and it's interesting how I came upon this idea and very I don't think anyone knows about this but I built this um, version. Um, anyway, that's another story. Maybe I won't go there. But anyway, this was um, the version where the table was too big. So the, the furniture, the chairs support the tabletop. But um, yeah, this was the original maquette for that plywood table at Feldman Gallery. And, um, you know, because um, I pre plan this so I could build it in my studio in plywood and and chairs. So that's a really crazy idea that the, the, the chairs are supporting the table. So what's happening? I mean, there seems to be happening something with the space under and the space mm -hmm. above. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, um, it's about community. When you sit in a chair and it's integrated into the edge of the table, you feel the weight of that table conceptually and philosophically. And so what it is, is all of these people and the chairs are stand-ins for people are doing the work of supporting that horizontal plane. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about that community. It's um, in Greek architecture, um, it's often you have, um, women holding up, you know, the, the building, karyatid, uh -huh. karyatids. Uh -huh. um, so here it's a bit more democratic in a way. It's, um, you know, it's like, we all do the work of supporting the table and the table itself is a kind of, I did another version, which is there is a kind of electrical charge where when two people sit at a table, electricity passes across the table to the other person. You don't see it and you don't feel it, but there's an electrical charge that's caused when you put your hands on a table and someone else is placing their hands on the table. And I did as versions of tablecloths that had clothing built into the tablecloth. So four white shirts sewn into a white tablecloth that also was exhibited at the Biennale this year. And um, the, the concept of four people wearing the table. And then I did another piece where four people wear independent, one table um, was cut diagonally with a jigsaw quickly and irregularly. It creates four separate tables. Each table is worn by a person. So there's this urge of four people wearing these quadrants to come together to complete the tabletop. So there are many projects that were based on this idea of, of sitting and bringing people together around the table. Uh, so I'm I'm wondering about the weight. You know that uh, so uh, this last slide that we saw uh, where you have this structure mm -hmm. and the structure is holding the table and you know like how heavy is that? Uh, I mean when pretty... I look. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, there's that absurdity of you know why would you do that? But actually, it was it's it's very comfortable, um, especially because okay. you know at the Biennale it was six months long, so I had to be at the Biennale for six months, nice. eight hours a day <laughs> holding that tape. Just kidding, it was a mannequin, <laughs> but it was um, it's not it's well, not a not problem. So I was worried about it, so months. I tried to make the tabletop very thin, and everything yeah. was like reduced. So it was functional. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
-hmm. Thank you. Well, um, it, it may be an interesting moment to uh, say good night. Yeah. It's, um, you know, Alan, it's, it's always uh, a mixed blessing to have such an immersive contact with, with you, with artists here in the show. And you realize there's just so much more. Um, oh, Sally, you want to say something? Nope. Okay. Hey, you got any snow in Minnesota, Sally? Snow? We got a foot on Friday. Oh, really? Wow. I look like a ghost. It's dark here. <laughs> no, you look good. Alan, yeah. thank you so much. I love hearing your explanations. Not being an artist, it's hard for me to understand. Mm. Well, thank you. Although but she's born one. Yeah. Right over here. <laughs> thank anyway, you. Um, I got to so run. Let, let's, let's do a screen share um, to say goodnight. And um, I'm not sure if Tamara wants to. Uh, bye bye, Elaine. Here's a screen share of Alan's work, um, which I edited lately today. Let's see. Um, One second, Adeline. I'm just about to say something. Oh, there's Tamara. Excellent. Hello. Well, thank you, Tamara. So, yeah, go, please, uh, if anybody has a comment or question for Tamara, this would be a nice time oh, to yeah. share. But, but um, welcome back, Tamara. Thank you. Really amazing conversation. Alan, that was very interesting. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing your work. Um, I wasn't familiar with it, and I'm glad that John introduced us to it. Yes, we're very excited yeah. about it. So can't wait to share it with everybody. Yes. And John, you'll send out a link on your site. Yes. Tomorrow's work, that would be great. Tomorrow's, and also we'll, we'll put a link for Todd and Terry's show. Yes, that would be great. On, on our resource section. Yeah. So uh, tomorrow's work will be on the resource section mm -hmm. as well. And we'll, we'll promote that again this week. That's and then excellent. that's during the next week. As we will your show, Alan. This show tonight will be uh, available for, you know, reviewing and viewing again for the first time. Thanks. All right. And uh, again, the invitation for the meditation on Thursday night, 4 p.m. Eastern time, uh, 9 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time, uh, and and links for that too. Mind Change Meditation for System Changers Platform. Okay, here comes the screen share. Be, be patient. Wait for it. Wait for it. They say. Okay, here it is. All right. Uh, screen share that one, and uh, this will be our sign off. So. Lots of love and good night. You yes. need to learn how to fail. And you have to fail once a day to be a great yeah. artist or a great designer. <laughs> the world should be. So yes, I was I would say John Cage, Arcel Duchamp were great influences, but also Andy Warhol. Um, I wanted to be the Andy Warhol of architecture. <laughs> and I found my name, Alan Wexler, A W had the same initials as Andy Warhol, A.W. So I said, I'm going to be the Andy Warhol of architecture. Uh, God darn it. Here. And I had the pleasure of being represented by Ronald Feldman Gallery um, for many years, where it had 10 solo exhibitions, and Ron Feldman um, was the publisher of Andy Warhol's prints. So there was a tie-in there. But the medium I'm working in is architecture. That is the material I work with. Some people work with clay, some people with pigment, some with stone. My material is architecture, is program. Eating, sleeping, bathing, earth, air, fire, water, vegetation. That's the material I work with. The height of the Vietnam War, and as a young student in architecture, exposed to the anti-war movement, I said, and it wasn't just me with other people, we felt 